Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. Guys, we have lots of news to talk about this week, from all the latest Starship updates to the three orbital launches we saw take place last week from three different countries. So let's not waste too much time in the intro. I always like to cheekily ask to make sure you're subscribed before we begin, since these videos are best enjoyed on the day of upload due to the very time-sensitive information contained within. So subscribing and ringing the bell helps ensure that you get notified of these videos on time and not like three weeks late. Anyway, let's begin our first segment, all the best news regarding SpaceX's Starship development. We have some more news regarding the explosive end to Starship SN11's test flight. As you all remember, SN11 was the latest Starship vehicle to make a high altitude flight test and all went pretty well initially. The ascent, belly flop maneuver and subsequent skydive all went to plan, but then moments after Raptor ignition, the whole thing went boom. <laughs> when we covered this last week, nobody, including SpaceX, was quite sure what happened. We'd initially thought that the flight termination system was to blame, although now we've had it pretty much confirmed that this wasn't the case. In response to a question about the SN11's rapid unplanned disassembly, Elon Musk wrote on Twitter that a relatively small methane leak resulted in a fire on one of the three Raptor engines, which fried part of the vehicle's avionics system, causing the chain of events that ultimately resulted in SN11 landing everywhere. <laughs> Hopefully all issues have been fixed in preparation for SN15's flight. SN15 was rolled out onto suborbital pad A last week to begin its testing campaign. While it's certainly possible it could perform its flight test this week, more realistically we'll probably see it undergo cryoproofing and possibly a static fire test over the next few days, with a flight more likely to happen in the second half of April. SN15 of course represents the biggest changes in a Starship vehicle since we went from SN6 to SN8. The SN15 is effectively an entirely different vehicle from the previous full-scale ones that we've seen being tested, even down to its Raptor engines. I'm therefore very optimistic that it'll perform better than its predecessors and will hopefully succeed at every aspect of its flight test. So far we've seen Starships explode on the launch pad, upon landing, after landing and before landing. So I mean, we're really running out of ways for these things to blow up. <laughs> yes, most of the Starship explosions have been associated with the landing burn, which in the future may not even be necessary. That's because Elon Musk posted the ludicrous initiative of wanting to catch the Starship during its horizontal glide, with no need for a landing burn. Now, the Starship doesn't glide like the space shuttle, but it falls like a skydiver, so it'll be quite the feat of engineering to figure out a system of catching it slowly enough to prevent the vehicle from being damaged. Eric posted an idea of what such a structure could look like, a giant sling that could absorb the energy of the falling vessel. Personally, while this is all very fun, I can't quite see this materialising, but then again, I said the same thing about the Snyder Cut, and that ended up being a thing. <laughs> As for the other Starship prototypes, Brendan never fails to supply us with these great infographics. As you can see, SN16 to 18 have had several components prepared, with the SN16 in particular coming very close to full assembly assembly, and the SN19 and 20 are in the early stages of construction, SN20 of course being very exciting as this, along with Super Heavy BN3, will be the first attempt at an orbital launch of Starship hardware. Very exciting stuff, but I'm going to leave it there for our coverage of Starship this week. Let's now take a look at what else was happening in the world of spaceflight last week. Last week we had some big developments over on the Red Planet. On the previous episode of Space This Week, we covered the successful deployment of the Ingenuity helicopter onto the surface of Mars. Of course, at that point it hadn't really done anything, just stood proud and independent of the Perseverance rover. Perseverance did take a nice selfie of the pair, <laughs> and Ingenuity went on to survive its first night alone on Mars, and on the 9th of April it successfully spun its rotors up for the first time. It didn't fly, but that wasn't the objective. This was simply a test of the motors and the rotors themselves ahead of the flight. We only have one shot at this, so it's important we take our time before throttling up those blades. We had three orbital launches take place last week. The first was on the 7th of April and was SpaceX's latest Starlink launch, Starlink L23. This was the 24th Starlink mission overall and was once again completed by a Falcon 9 rocket launched from Cape Canaveral, marking this particular Falcon 9's first stages 
his seventh flight overall. Not long after second stage separation, the first stage successfully landed around 631 kilometers downrange from the launch pad on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship, and a fairing recovery attempt was made by SpaceX's fairing recovery ship Sheila Bordelon. While unfortunately the active fairing half was lost, the passive half was successfully lifted from the water. The 60 Starlink satellites were deployed successfully at an altitude of 550 kilometers, the standard altitude for Starlink satellites. The second launch of the week was on the 8th of April and was a Chinese Long March 4B, which launched from the Taiwan Launch Complex carrying a Xi'an 6 technology demonstration satellite into low Earth orbit. Unfortunately, not much else is really known about the payload as there is no publicly available information on the Xi'an 6 satellites. The final launch of the week was something we all know though, another old faithful Soyuz rocket. This was a Soyuz 2.1, which launched on the 9th of April from the Baikonur Cosmodrome, carrying three people to the International Space Station. They are two Russian cosmonauts, Oleg Novitki and Pyotr Dubrov, and NASA astronaut Mark Van Hai. The spacecraft is scheduled to return to Earth on the 13th of October, following 180 days in space, and is expected to also serve as the return vehicle for Russian actress and film director Klim Shipenko, who will launch to the ISS on the next crewed Soyuz mission, MS-19, to spend around one week on the station to film a movie. Very exciting stuff. <laughs> the arrival of the crew to the International Space Station presented an interesting dilemma. For the first time ever, there are now 10 people living aboard the space station, despite the station only having seven crew quarters on board. Due to the higher passenger count, some of the crew will sleep aboard the Dragon crew capsule, which has been docked to the station since facilitating the Crew-1 launch. Until last week, it was blocking the docking port needed for the upcoming Crew-2 mission, but on the 5th of April, it was relocated to a different docking port by NASA astronauts Michael Hopkins, Victor Glover and Shannon Walker, as well as JAXA astronaut Soichi Noguchi. With the final launch of last week all said and done, let's move along to our next segment now, all the stuff we can expect to see happen over the next seven days. Unfortunately, there are no orbital launches expected to happen this week, but we are expecting the Ingenuity Mars helicopter to fly no earlier than the 14th of April, which is only a couple of days away. It was originally planned for either yesterday or today, but during the rotor spin test, the sequence ended a little bit early during the transition from pre-flight to flight mode. The team is currently diagnosing the issue. In fact, hopefully they've now figured out the anomaly and all is well. It's already been confirmed that Ingenuity is still safe and healthy, ready to make the first Martian helicopter flight. If successful, it'll be a huge leap forward in our exploration of Mars. To date, powered and fully controlled atmospheric flight has never been achieved anywhere other than on Earth. It'll be no small feat if Ingenuity works. Powered flight on Mars is extremely difficult compared to Earth because of how thin its atmosphere is. It's less than 1% that of Earth's. So the engineers had to develop a helicopter that's both light enough to be lifted and have a motor powerful enough to spin the rotors to very high speeds, around 2,000 to 3,000 revolutions per minute. And of course, those aren't the only two considerations. Ingenuity also needs to be fully autonomous, which further eats into the strict weight budget. The first flight will be a short hop, mostly just to test that it can indeed fly, and we should be able to watch it make this attempt from the eyes of the Perseverance rover, which will be watching from a safe 100 meter distance. The first flight will pretty much be a simple straight up, hover, then straight down affair, but once it's completed, we can expect to see Ingenuity make up to four more flights over the course of the month, each flight expected to be at an altitude ranging from three to five meters above the ground, with some horizontal traversal thrown in, lasting for up to 90 seconds. Seconds. Yes, I know, not exactly an epic voyage, but Ingenuity is really just a Pathfinder vehicle, since we don't really know if or how possible helicopter flight will be on a planet with an atmosphere as thin as Mars is. If it does indeed prove the validity of aerial vehicles on Mars, then future missions could make use of a flying probe that scouts locations of interest and assist in planning driving routes for Mars rovers. Ingenuity is a very impressive mission to watch, and if we're lucky, we'll get some cool aerial photography out of it as well as the Ingenuity has a small camera on board. Here's a picture it took of some dirt. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Anyway, as mentioned, that's the biggest piece of news happening this week, and there aren't any launches happening, so that's pretty much it for this segment of the show. Let's now move along to our final segment, all the best historic spaceflight anniversaries that are set to take place over the next seven days. 
There is a huge anniversary today, the 12th of April, and that's because on this day in 1961, Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome aboard a Vostok K rocket and became the first human to travel into outer space and perform the first crewed orbital flight. The spaceflight consisted of a single low Earth orbit and lasted a total of 108 minutes from launch to landing. The success of Vostok 1 was a huge leap forward for humanity and a huge win for the Soviet Union in the space race. The flight sent shockwaves around the world and remains one of the most important historic events in our history. There's really so much that could be discussed with this mission and its implications, but sadly there just isn't enough time for this series' format unfortunately. Plus, showing too much footage of the launch tends to land your copyright strike with the BBC for some reason, so I'll leave it at that. Also on the 12th of April, the first ever launch of a space shuttle took place. This was STS-1 and used the Columbia shuttle. What's interesting about this flight is that the external fuel tank of the shuttle, usually remembered for its iconic orange colour, was painted white for this launch. That's because for STS-1 and 2, Lockheed Martin was concerned about ultraviolet light damaging the tank, and the white paint served as a protective coating. After it turned out that this wasn't actually going to be a problem, the paint was removed, leaving the rust-coloured spray-on insulation unpainted, which saved a whopping 200 172 kilograms. For Americans watching, this is the same as about 91 AR-15s. Although the launch took place on the same day as Yuri Gagarin's flight, this was only a coincidence and wasn't a celebration of the anniversary. STS-1 was actually supposed to launch two days prior, but was delayed due to a technical problem. On the 13th of April, one of the oxygen tanks aboard the service module of Apollo 13 exploded, triggering the chain of events that almost put a fatal end to NASA's third moon landing mission. I discussed Apollo 13 in quite a lot of detail in last week's video, so I'm not going to repeat myself here, but check out that video if you want to hear a bit more about this anniversary. On the 16th of April in 1962, Apollo 16 was launched. This was the 10th crewed mission of the Apollo program and the 5th one to land on the moon. The lunar lander would touch down on the moon's surface on the 21st of April with astronauts John Young and Charles Duke on board. The pair spent a total of 71 hours on the surface, during which they conducted just over 20 hours of extravehicular activities, which included the second ever use of the lunar rover, which was driven nearly 27 kilometers across the surface. The pair collected the largest moon rock collection during the Apollo program too, gathering almost 96 kilograms of material in total. All in all, the mission was another huge success for the Apollo program, and the crew successfully splashed down in the Pacific Ocean 265 hours, 51 minutes and 5 seconds after liftoff. The launch of Apollo 16 was the last anniversary I wanted to discuss this week, which brings an end to this week's history segment. Now, I did spend a little bit less time on each respective anniversary this week. I'm just trialing out not having the history segment of these videos take up the majority of the runtime. Is it better, like, having these uh, sort of shorter chunks? Let me know what your thoughts were down below. Anyway. <laughs> That's a wrap for this week's instalment of Space This Week. We saw a nice variety of launches last week from countries across the world. It's a shame that as of now there's no concrete confirmation of any launches over the next seven days, but who knows? China has been known to surprise us with last minute launch news, and of course there's always the possibility that SpaceX will launch the SN15 into the skies. I guess the real reason no launches are happening is because nobody wants to steal the spotlight from the ingenuity, which of course we hope to see fly very, very soon. Only time will tell. For now, we'll leave it there. On screen, there's a list of my Patreons who make this content possible and, of course, get slightly early access to the videos when I'm able to offer it. There's a link to my Patreon on screen as well now, as well as a button to subscribe and two videos for you to check out. The top is a video suggested personally for you by YouTube and the bottom one is my most recent upload. So, statistically speaking, it's most likely to be my latest Kerbal adventure. Enjoy and thank you all for watching.